This course will analyze the economics of the well-being of adolescents. First, we will discuss what makes adolescents different from earlier ages of childhood and how some of the specific characteristics of adolescents are captured by some economic models. We will then proceed to analyze empirical analysis of the well-being of adolescents, measured by their education and health outcomes. And finally, we will cover agency, broadly defined as the ability to make decisions about one's own life and act on them to achieve a desired outcome, and how lack of agency is manifested as child marriage and exposure to violence. Let us first consider the conceptual framework in which to analyze adolescence outcomes. The period we know as adolescence does not have a fixed age definition. It is determined both by biological changes as well as changes in our social roles. So that while there is a general consensus about the beginning of adolescence, the onset of puberty, the end of adolescence and beginning of adulthood is less clearly defined. Historically, the transition to adulthood was marked by marriage and parenthood, and since the age at which this occurs varies by culture, and since age of marriage and parenthood has been delayed, a universal end to adolescence is difficult to define. Additionally, some biological changes, specifically neurological processes and development of executive functions, continue to occur into the late 20s. Other concepts have recently emerged, such as youth, 15 to 24 years of age, and emerging adulthood, 18 to 25 years of age. Nonetheless, for the purpose of analysis and definition of targeted policies, it is important to reach a consensus. For this course, we will adhere to the UN definition of adolescence as the phase of life between childhood and adulthood, broadly defined as ages 10 to 19. It is a period when individuals gain and develop educational and social skills that will determine future employment, empowerment, health, and well-being. Next, we will study three economic models that explain the decision-making made by adolescents and which consider, to some extent, the particular characteristics of this period of life. The first economic model we analyze is the simplest framework, which is very flexible and which does not differentiate adolescents from other economic agents. In this framework, agents, that is adolescents, maximize their utility under different resource constraints. We will consider here the simplest case, a static unitary model, but this can be extended to dynamic and collective decision-making settings. We will assume that adolescents are fully rational agents, an assumption questioned in the next model, and that amongst the costs and benefits they consider are social recognition and punishment by their peers. As an example, let us consider the decision made by an adolescent between continuing her education or working in the labor market. A model that captures this decision is a utility maximization where the adolescent obtains utility from a consumption good denominated by C and from education directly denominated by E. To simplify the analysis, we assume that the price of the consumption good equals 1 and that education is publicly provided so that it has zero monetary costs. Education requires time spent on homework and studying denominated by H. Individuals face two constraints, a time constraint and a budget constraint. In the time constraint, total time, or T, is distributed between homework and hours spent working in the labor market, denominated by L. Total time, T, is a constant and is a given parameter. So when individuals choose optimal education, they also choose optimal labor time as well because it is the difference between total time and optimal education. In the budget constraint, the cost of consumption must be less than or equal to the income generated from working, which is the market wage, W, times the hours spent working, L, plus any non-labor income, N. Here we assume strict equality. If both constraints are combined, and if we let T equal 24, to represent the 24 hours in a day, then a full income constraint is derived. The term to the left reflects total potential consumption. In other words, 
total consumption of the consumption and education goods valued at the respective prices. Note that the price of the education good or homework is an opportunity cost of the time dedicated to education. It is the foregone wage by not spending that amount of time working in the market. The term to the right-hand side of the total constraint is potential income. It is the maximum labor income possible if individuals spent all their time working for wage W plus their non-labor income N. We will not work through the mathematical steps of solving the model, but it is straightforward to derive the optimal conditions to choose quantities of consumption, education, and labor. Individuals choose H and C so that the ratio of the marginal utilities of homework to consumption is equal to the relative price W divided by 1, which is the price of consumption. This framework makes it possible to conceptualize and analyze the effects of the determinants of the schooling and work decision. It provides a framework to understand the anticipated effects of changes in the wage, which is the opportunity cost of adolescence time. The model can be extended to incorporate non-market work as well as household work, which is very relevant in the case of girls. The main lessons from this model are that adolescents' school work decisions can be attributed to different preferences for consumption and education, to differences in wages or the opportunity cost of time, and to changes in non-wage income. Variables that affect these dimensions will also affect adolescents' choices, and the model can predict the direction of such changes. Later in the course, we will study different empirical papers that have analyzed many programs or changes in economic conditions that can be framed within this flexible model. The basic utility maximization framework can also be extended to explain several stylized facts or characteristics common to developing countries, such as gender bias in favor of boys and underinvestment in education. Possible ways would be to model heterogeneous agents or a collective bargaining process within households to explain gender bias and to model education as a dynamic investment decision where liquidity or credit constraints are present. Next, we will analyze an economic model that captures less than rational behavior by adolescents to explain their decision to engage in risky behaviors. In more recent models of adolescents' decisions and behaviors, economists have incorporated characteristics that have long been observed by developmental psychologists. One of them is that adolescents cannot fully assess the future costs and benefits of their present decisions. In other words, they are myopic. This framework can help shed light on decisions made by adolescents to engage in risky behaviors that have potentially serious future consequences. Let us consider a model where agents are making decisions, and they are myopic. We will ignore uncertainty to simplify the discussion. Individuals wish to maximize lifetime utility, which is the sum of utility at each period of individuals' lives, present and future. In our notation here, WT is lifetime utility, and instantaneous utility at each period is denominated by U tau. Tau is an index for each time period, beginning in the present period T, the next period T plus 1, through the end of one's life at period T. At any moment in time, there exists a probability of death, Q. Thus, the probability of survival to the next period is 1 minus Q, which we denominate with delta. Individuals discount each future period by this probability of survival. In each period of life, the value of future lifetime utility can be estimated from the true, actual probability of survival. As an example, from the perspective of the present period, today, which we denote by t equals zero, the expression for future utility from the perspective of period t equals zero is the sum of all future utilities discounted by the survival factor. Myopia occurs when the survival factor considered in the decision-making process is smaller than the actual true probability of survival. Intuitively, they assign too much weight to present utility or utility near the present period, 
and too little weight to utility later on in life. This can be expressed by a survival factor, such as delta hat, that is less than the true survival probability delta. The consequence of myopia can be characterized in a simple example. Consider a model with two periods. Period 1 is youth and period 2 is adulthood. And suppose that all individuals reach adulthood, which implies that delta equals 1. Individuals must choose their sexual behavior. If individuals choose to have unprotected sex, their utility in period 1 equals 10. However, they contract HIV AIDS and in period 2 their utility is negative 15. Utility from the alternative behavior abstinence yields zero utility in both periods. Under appropriate discounting, that is, the true discount factor is equal to 1, adolescents would choose abstinence because the expected lifetime utility from unprotected sex equals negative 5. However, with any discount smaller than or equal to two-thirds, adolescents discount future disutility too much, and the expected lifetime utility from unprotected sex is positive, so that they choose to have unprotected sex. This type of modeling can explain risky behaviors in a dynamic framework where agents are not fully capable of weighing the future costs and benefits of present choices. Another characteristic of adolescence is that during this period, individuals are strongly influenced by their peers. This characteristic of adolescence can be captured by economic models of peer effects, where individual welfare from their own decisions is also affected by decisions made by other adolescents. In these models, there are at least two channels of social interactions. One is the social multiplier effect of individual decisions, in other words, each adolescent's decision has an externality, positive or negative, on other adolescents. Another channel is through social norms. These theoretical models are complex and we will not work through them here. For the purpose of this course, it is sufficient to be familiar with the intuition of such models. Most empirical analysis confirm that peers affect each other. In this section, we will analyze adolescents' human capital outcomes, their education, employment, and health outcomes. For each specific outcome we analyze in this section of the course, we will begin by describing the current state in different regions of the world, followed by discussions about which policies have been found to affect the outcomes. Before continuing to analyze human capital, let us consider the world's population and how large the adolescent and youth population is in each of the world's regions, following World Bank classifications. Adhering to the definition of adolescence as the period between 10 and 19 years of age, we can observe that in Europe, North America, and East Asia in the Pacific, adolescents represent between 11.4 and 12.9 percent of the population. In South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, however, Adolescents represent 18.9 and 23.1% of the population, respectively. Let us now turn to analyze the state of educational outcomes in these regions. The first target of Sustainable Development Goal 4, SDG 4, is to ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. Most countries have made significant progress regarding universal primary education, reaching 92% coverage in the world in 2015. Since reaching that level, most countries have begun to shift attention in mobilizing resources to meet SDG 4 regarding secondary schooling. Before analyzing secondary completion, it is important to know what percentages of adolescents enroll in school. This figure presents net secondary enrollment rates, that is, the percentage of adolescents of secondary school age who are enrolled in school, for boys and girls in blue and orange, respectively. As this figure reveals, there are large differences in secondary enrollment across regions of the world, 
richer nations in North America, Europe, and Central Asia have almost reached universal secondary enrollment, while in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, progress has been much slower. In Sub-Saharan Africa, only one in three adolescents of secondary school age are enrolled, while in South Asia, about 60% of adolescents enroll in secondary school. Regarding gender gaps in two regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, and North Africa, girls are less likely to be enrolled in secondary school compared to boys. In all other regions, either there is no gender gap or there is higher enrollment among girls. On average, in the world, the percentage of boys and girls enrolled in secondary school is the same, 66%. Not all of those enrolled complete secondary school. This figure reveals that completion rates are far from reaching SDG 4 in most developing regions. To monitor advancement towards SDG 4, secondary education has been classified into lower secondary, the first two years, and higher secondary, the latter years. This figure presents lower secondary completion rates across regions for boys, blue, and girls orange. Of those who enroll in secondary school in sub-Saharan Africa, only 47% of boys and 42% of girls complete the first years of their secondary education. In other words, they don't advance to the latter years. Conditional on enrollment, the completion rates in other regions are much higher and girls are more likely to complete lower secondary school than boys. However, in developing regions, the dropout rates from lower secondary are high, from about 10% in East Asia to more than 50% in Sub-Saharan Africa. As we covered in Section 1 of the course, there are multiple reasons that influence adolescents' decision to stay or abandon secondary school. For example, adolescents may find that investing in education is not worthwhile if future wages for high school graduates are low and or if current wages are high. Alternatively, they may face poverty and financial constraints so that they cannot cover the financial costs of staying in school. Furthermore, social norms may lead some adolescents, especially girls, into parenthood at early ages. In the next slides, we will look at the effectiveness of different policies on secondary completion and on dropout numbers. All of the empirical results we will study in this course were carried out with methodologies that were able to establish a causal effect of the policy on adolescence outcomes. Conditional cash transfers have been implemented across many developing countries. They aim to create incentives to invest in children's human capital, especially in the early ages. Since CCTs have been in place for many years, it's possible to analyze, in some cases, their long-term effects, including the impact on adolescents' educational decisions. This slide presents results from analyzing the PKH Conditional Cash Transfer Program in Indonesia. It experimentally estimates the impacts of PKH six years after the program launched. The program has halved the share of children aged 7 to 15 who are not enrolled in school and has increased the rate of high school completion. A study in Indonesia reveals that conditional cash transfers have been effective in increasing secondary education outcomes. This slide presents regression results of estimates of the effect of receiving a conditional cash transfer on secondary school enrollment, attendance, and completion measured six years after receiving the CCT. All regressions find positive, statistically significant effects. A conditional cash transfer program in Honduras also had important positive long-term effects on educational outcomes. The study presented here finds that if a household benefited from CCTs early in life, children, both boys and girls, were more likely to obtain four or more years of education, to complete secondary school, and to enroll in some university studies. The positive effects of CCTs in Honduras have been concentrated among non-Indigenous children. This slide reports evidence of the effects of a program in Bangladesh aimed at reducing child marriage and teenage childbearing, as well as increasing girls' educational achievements. 
The randomized intervention included 1. a six-month empowerment program, 2. a financial incentive of cooking oil to encourage parents to delay their daughter's marriage until age 18, or 3. an empowerment program plus an incentive. This table reveals the effects of the interventions on girls 4.5 years after the program began. The girls included in this table were age 15 to 17 at the beginning of the interventions, and the outcomes included whether they were in school from the ages 22 to 25, as well as their level of completion. This table reveals the effects of the interventions on girls 4.5 years after the program began. The girls included in this table were age 15 to 17 at the beginning of the interventions, and the outcomes included whether they were in school from the ages 22 to 25, as well as their level of completion. Results, results reveal that girls who received the financial incentive were more likely to be in school in their early 20s and had completed more school compared to those that did not receive the incentive. The empowerment program had smaller effects. Also, reducing the cost of education has been found to affect secondary school outcomes. A policy that eliminated school fees in the Gambia led to better academic achievements amongst girls. Non-financial incentives also affect educational outcomes especially because education decisions are interrelated with decisions regarding employment and unprotected sexual activity, which can result in early childbearing. A recent analysis of the effects of increased access to emergency contraception in Chile finds that this measure reduced high school dropout rates amongst girls. The results were concentrated in low-income public schools, suggesting that poorer girls benefited most from the policy. Advances in secondary school education are susceptible to changes in economic conditions. Teenagers face a trade-off between remaining in school and working. When wages or wage employment increases, adolescents may decide to work at the expense of completing their education, or they may remain in school because they are able to overcome liquidity constraints. In Côte d'Ivoire, evidence confirms that economic booms in the cocoa sector led to greater employment among older adolescent boys and less schooling among younger adolescent girls. In the next slides, we consider the status of adolescent and youth employment and the factors and policies that affect it. SDG goals and targets refer to youth employment, which includes young people aged 15 to 24. We will refer to this age group in this section about employment. The SDG goals related to youth employment aim to increase skills for future employment, achieve productive employment in decent jobs, reduce the proportion of youths that are not in employment, education, or training, referred to as NEETS in the literature, and design a strategy for youth employment. This slide reveals that the share of youths that are employed varies widely across regions, and has remained relatively stable over the past decade. In many regions, such as Eastern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, among others, more than 40% of youths aged 15 to 24 are employed, either while in school or out of school. In these regions, poverty is correlated with the decision to work. In Eastern Europe, Southern Asia and Europe, between 30 to 35 percent of young people work due to various factors. Finally, in North Africa and the Arab states, approximately 25 percent of young people are employed, mostly explained by the fact that few young women work. In the past 20 years or so, labor force participation rates of young people have fallen, explained by increases in exclusive enrollment in higher education. Eastern Asia has witnessed the greatest decline of 23%, followed by South Asia and North America, with declines of 11.5 and 10%, respectively. Here we present the share of young people who are not in employment, education, or training, NEETS, revealing large disparities across world regions in by sex. In East Asia, less than 5% of people aged 15 to 24 are NEET, while in North Africa and South Asia, 
more than 25% are out of employment, education, or training. In almost all of the world's regions, with the exception of Europe, a higher share of women than men are not employed nor in educational or training activities, most likely because they are dedicated to household activities, which include caring for others, most likely their children or the elderly in their households. Among South Asian youths who are not in employment or education or training activities, the ratio of women to men is 8 to 1. Among seven Latin American countries studied by Novella et al., approximately 45% of young men and 31% of young women were employed, and 14 and 27% of men and women were NEAT, respectively. This study on NEATs sought to describe the activities undertaken by youths who reported they were neither in school nor employed. The study reveals that NEATs in Latin America are busy. They are actively seeking employment, taking care of family members, and or taking care of domestic chores or a family business. Less than 3% of NEAT youths reported no activity and no disability. Young people's investment in their human capital, either through education, employment, or training, is relevant in order to achieve SDG goals of decent work according to ILO employment estimates for young workers about 126 million young workers were living in poverty or extreme poverty in 2019 equivalent to almost 30 percent of young workers projections for 2023 predict a modest decline to 28 percent however it is likely that the COVID-19 pandemic will revise the projections of shares of young workers in poverty or working poor upwards. The largest shares of poor and extremely poor young workers live in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Together, these regions represented more than 80% of young workers in poverty or extreme poverty. The next three slides present empirical evidence of training and educational programs that have had a positive impact on employment outcomes of young workers. This slide presents the results of a randomized evaluation of on-the-job and classroom training for disadvantaged unemployed youths in Bangladesh with four possible employment outcomes, being self-employed, being a casual day worker, being employed for a wage, and any employment. The program provided classroom and on-the-job training, and all participants also received job placement assistance. About half of the participants received only the on-the-job training, and the other half received both components. The U's were followed for three years, so it is possible to estimate the short-term effects one year after and longer-term effects of the training two years after receiving it. The author finds that U's who participated in the training program had better quality jobs. On-the-job training only improved all job outcomes. Program participants were more likely to be self-employed and wage-employed, and less likely to be casual laborers. The combined intervention, the on-the-job and classroom training, increased the likelihood of wage employment and of being employed. Using a regression discontinuity design, an evaluation of a similar program in Nepal also found positive effects on youth employment outcomes. Youths benefiting from skills training and job placement services were more likely to be employed in better jobs, to work more hours, and earn higher wages than youths that did not receive the services and training. In a third study, a team of researchers conducted randomized public lotteries in which applicants to 10 oversubscribed vocational schools were randomly assigned admissions. Those who were randomly admitted and those that were not were followed, and their future employment outcomes were compared. The authors find that two years after finishing vocational schools, those who were admitted were more likely to be employed, and that the effects on employment were greater for women. Furthermore, the vocational programs also led to higher earnings among women. The studies analyzed thus far reveal that education and employment outcomes of adolescents and youths can be positively affected by different types of policies 
as well as changes in economic conditions. In the next section, we will analyze different dimensions of adolescents' health, as well as recent research on the policies that can improve it. The main health issues affecting adolescents worldwide are injuries, mental health issues, violence both within and outside the household, alcohol and drug use, early pregnancy and childbirth, and HIV, AIDS, and other infectious diseases. In their most extreme manifestations, these health issues can result in deaths. More than one million adolescents die each year. The highest death rates are in Africa, Eastern Mediterranean countries, and South and East Asia. Furthermore, the leading causes of deaths among adolescents were, for boys, road injury, interpersonal violence, self-harm, drowning, HIV AIDS, respiratory infections, and diarrheal diseases. Among girls, the leading causes were HIV AIDS, maternal conditions, self-harm, road injuries, respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, tuberculosis, and malaria. While we will focus on two of the main adolescent health issues, early childbearing and HIV AIDS, let us look in a more general way at other challenges adolescents face. Adolescents are exposed to different forms of violence. Approximately 40% of adolescents report being victims or having been exposed directly to bullying, a form of psychological violence in school settings. And about one in eight young people report having been victims of sexual abuse. In the last part of the course about agency, we will discuss other forms of violence. During the adolescent period, the transition from childhood to adulthood occurs. Due to neurological and other physical changes during this developmental stage, many mental health conditions develop. In fact, half of all mental health conditions begin by age 14. If untreated, some mental health conditions lead to self-harm and injury, and they account for 16% of all injuries among adolescents. Depression, for instance, is one of the leading causes of illness and disability among adolescents, and suicide is the third leading cause of death among older adolescents. We will now turn to analyze two health challenges that result from adolescents' decisions to engage in unprotected sexual activity, motherhood and contracting HIV-AIDS. Both of these can lead to health problems for adolescent women and newborns and to longer-term health and economic consequences. Worldwide, 42 out of 1,000 women aged 15 to 19 give birth. However, the world average hides large differences across regions. For example, in Europe and North America, the adolescent fertility rate is approximately 17 births per 1,000 women, while in Latin America and Africa, the rate is 62 and 101 births per 1,000 adolescent women, respectively. This reveals that in some regions of the world, addressing adolescent pregnancy and motherhood is an important public policy priority due to the health risks to the young mother and child and to the long-run health and economic consequences which mostly affect young women. Among the economic consequences of teen motherhood are lower educational outcomes, which reduces the possibility of working as well as the quality of employment young mothers are able to find. With data covering a 25-year period, a study for Chile found that having a child during adolescence affects several educational and employment outcomes later in life. Columns 1 through 3 of this table present results of logistic regressions analyzing whether having been a mother during adolescence affected the probabilities of finishing secondary school, ever attending a technical or a vocational institute, or ever attending a university. Odds ratios are presented so that a coefficient less than one means it is less likely an event will occur. Results reveal that adolescent motherhood reduced the likelihoods of completing secondary school and of attending higher education, either at the technical or university level. 
Furthermore, fewer years of education are completed by adolescent mothers, column 4, and young mothers earn less than non-mothers. Having established some of the negative educational and employment consequences, we will next analyze policies that have reduced adolescent motherhood in different parts of the world. Some educational policies can reduce teen motherhood statistics. For example, in Chile, a national education policy that extended school schedules led to a lower probability of becoming an adolescent mother, probably because by staying in school for a greater number of hours, adolescents spent more time under adult supervision. A similar finding was found for Brazil. A secondary school expansion policy was found to reduce the number of births among 15 to 19 year old women. This table presents the results of difference in difference regressions, which reveal that in municipalities with greater secondary school density, the adolescent fertility rate is lower. Health policies that improve access to contraceptives also reduce adolescent motherhood which in turn has been found to reduce secondary school dropout rates in Chile. This table presents results of the impact of a randomized intervention in Bangladesh. The interventions were 1. a six-month empowerment program, 2. a financial incentive of cooking oil to encourage parents to delay their daughter's marriage until age 18, or 3. empowerment program plus incentive, which we discussed earlier in relation to educational outcomes. This table reveals the effects of the interventions on empowerment and gender attitudes of girls years after the program began. Results reveal that the empowerment program improved girls' empowerment and gender attitudes towards more agency. The financial incentive alone reduced girls' mobility. However, the financial incentive plus empowerment program had a net positive impact on young women's mobility. Many adolescents lack agency. They are not free to make their own decisions for various reasons. We will discuss two instances where their agency is diminished or taken away altogether, child marriage and violence and conflict. Child marriage, defined as marriage by age 18, is not uncommon. In developing countries, one-third of girls are married before age 18. The average regional prevalence of child marriage ranges from 21% in Africa and 17% in Latin America and the Caribbean to 8% in Eastern and Southern Europe. However, these averages hide large differences within and across regions. The prevalence of child marriage ranges from 2% in Algeria and Libya to as high as 74 and 75% in Niger and Bangladesh. What causes child marriage? Several factors are associated with it. Economic factors like poverty are one of the causes. However, social norms and discrimination against girls are other important factors. Families in poverty often believe that a way to provide for their daughter's future is through marriage before age 18. They often believe it will improve their child's economic and social well-being. However, girls who marry young are more likely to remain poor even after marriage, and since their husbands are often older, young brides are often disempowered within the marriage. As a result, young girls cannot refuse sex to their husbands, they cannot demand protected sex, and they are at greater risk of intimate partner violence and of contracting HIV-AIDS from their husbands. Recent research also suggests that, at a macro level, 
child marriage is also negatively correlated with economic growth. Research finds that child marriage is negatively correlated with secondary school enrollment and completion. In Uganda, research finds that girls who married at young ages were less likely to be enrolled in or complete secondary schooling. The younger they were when they married, the less likely they were to enroll and complete secondary school. Financial incentives to delay marriage were effective in Bangladesh. The empowerment program did not impact age at marriage. However, the financial incentive to parents increased marriage age and reduced the likelihood that girls married before ages 18 and 16. The same policy in Bangladesh, a transfer of cooking oil conditional on delaying marriage, also delayed fertility. It increased age at first birth, decreased the likelihood of giving birth before age 20, decreased the number of children before age 20, and decreased the interval between births. Weather shocks affect child marriage through its impact on families' incomes that come from agriculture. In an analysis of several sub-Saharan African countries, droughts led to higher bride prices in countries with prevalent bride price customs, and they led to lower dowry payments in countries with dowry traditions, like Eritrea. Another instance where agency is reduced or eliminated for adolescents is exposure to violence. This figure presents a proportion of young adult women who report experiencing sexual violence by age 18 across different regions and countries. It is important to remember that this figure may be underreporting sexual violence if respondents do not reveal its incidence due to fear of retribution, shame, or other factors. A more common form of violence is physical violence with one's intimate partner. This figure presents the incidence of intimate partner violence, or IPV, across different regions. In Southeast Asia and Africa, 43 and 40 percent of adolescent women that have ever had partners report suffering physical violence. While large differences exist, the incidence of physical violence during adolescence is also high in more developed regions, such as Europe, where 25 percent of adolescent girls report suffering from IPV. In many instances, social norms regarding IPV can play a role in its prevalence. Many women believe that there exist reasons that justify wife-beating. Age is related to this belief. Younger women are more likely to consider wife-beating acceptable compared to older women. Another form of violence is domestic violence which can be physical and or verbal violence between adults, parents, towards children, or both. Recent research finds that domestic violence in one's home affects adolescents' own education and that there are externalities onto peers in school. Not only are affected adolescents more likely to drop out of school and be sick more often, their classmates are also more likely to drop out and be sick. Furthermore, their test scores and peers' test scores suffer as well. Another form of violence which adolescents are exposed to in many parts of the world is political or military conflict. Empirical evidence has found that exposure to conflict during childhood and adolescence can have long-lasting consequences. This table presents results of estimations of the impact of exposure to the Nigerian Civil War between 1967 and 1970, when individuals were aged between 0 and 16 years on later health outcomes in adulthood. Authors find that individuals exposed to the war at all ages between birth and adolescence exhibit reduced adult stature and a higher incidence of being overweight. The impacts are largest amongst those who are exposed to the war during adolescence. Finally, recent research about the effects of exposure to violent crime in Mexico finds that young men living in areas with higher homicide rates completed less schooling. The research suggests that exposure to violent crime affected adolescents' mental health. They were more likely to experience severe fear at night which may have been responsible for decreased education outcomes.